So, let me <coughs> give you some brief idea about the development perspective. 21st century belongs to Asia. 21st century belongs to India. Now, this is not a statement made by any enthusiastic politician of this region. These, both these statements are emerging from a rigorous research study conducted by Asian Development Bank called Asia 2030, Asia 2050. They use a general equilibrium framework. I don't want to go into the details. You see, this is the share of Asian GDP in the total GDP. I mean, I'm keeping the focus on Asia because as you said in the first letter that we'll have Asian perspective, but I'll soon switch over to some of the Indian specificities. You look at share of Asia in the year 1700, which is around 60% of the global income. It came down as low as 14% by 1970. But now, from 1970 onwards, it is going up. It's about 25-26% now, and it is expected to touch again 50% by 2050. As I said, Indian economy growth is going to be spectacular, not nothing to do with the present current politics of the country, who wins, who loses. This is based on the structural parameters of demographic dividend, you know about it. The youthful population percentage would increase. Also, our savings rate is very high, and there are many other structural factors. Okay, this is the beautiful curve, which is going up. You see, the red one is at current prices for GDP. The blue one is at 2004-05 prices. So, obviously, at, in the year 2004-05, these two income data would be the same. You see that this curve is showing not an up increasing trend only, the slope of the curve is changing and it is becoming sharper and sharper, which really means that the rate of growth of Indian economy, barring some annual fluctuations, have been steadily increasing. The growth rate between 50, 1950 and 1980 was something less than 3%. Between 1980 and 1990, it became something like 4.2%. And then again, it went up to 5%. And from 2004 5 Till today, I would say there have been massive fluctuations, but still our growth rate has been about 7% per annum compared to Europe. Many of the European countries are struggling to keep their economy above zero level. The economies, many of the countries are in fact going down. Last year when I was teaching in Germany, this was the issue which was being discussed, that how come India is discussing if the growth rate goes below 5%, everybody is upset, the government changes. But certainly, Indian economy has shown sturdiness quite, uh, you know, strong from 19, uh, 2004-05 onwards. Just have a look at the other one. This is at nominal prices, then purchasing power parity. You know, uh, the value of dollar one dollar what it can buy in the United States of America or in Europe is much less. You can't even have a proper breakfast. But if you have one dollar's worth of Indian money, you can have certainly a breakfast. So Indian, if you take purchasing power parity, our income level is reasonably, I mean, going up satisfactorily. Look at the growth fluctuations. Well, India and China, I've just plotted them here. Europe, look at that. It is going below zero level altogether, but they are struggling to keep their growth rate above zero, but Indian economy, with some fluctuations, have shown remarkable, you know, performance, I would say, compared to the global standard. And by the way, current year, Indian growth rate is higher than China. It's the highest in the world if you take the large countries together. And let me give you a beautiful picture, which will again further boost our ego. This is prepared by Brookings Institute, and this is also supported by 
ADB's calculations. What does it give? Give the share of different countries in the global manufactured product. The middle class consumption of global manufactured product, what is the share of different countries? Look at the share of China, it's about 4 or 5 percent now, but this is going to be 22 percent. This is the share of China by 2050. So Chinese middle class is, a, is an emerging phenomena, and I remember last year I was invited by a French rating agency, one from India, one from China, to talk about how the middle class in India and China can help to stabilize the European economies. You know, they are looking for market, and India and China is going to provide a huge market Look at the share of India, right now it is less than that of China, but India's share is going to be 28%, which is even higher than Chinese. And if you take all the Asian countries together, it is more than 62%. This brown patch stands for other Asian countries. So basically the point I'm making is that given the structural factors, the demographic advantage that Asia has in terms of youthful population, savings rate, some of the resource base being there in Asian countries, our economy is going to do reasonably well. What about urbanization? What is the scenario that is projected for urbanization? Uh, look at the World Bank's projection of Indian urbanization, Asian urbanization. They say that Epicenter of urbanization is shifting from Latin America to Asia. You know, Latin America in 1850 had something like 40% people living in urban areas. Within 40 years, the percentage of urban population became 80% in most of the Latin American countries. Now, the world level banking institutions are saying Asia is going to do exactly the same which Latin America did in the second half of the last century, that means between 1950 and 2000, Latin American urbanization grew like anything. That is the prediction, that urban avalanche, quote unquote, from ADB, Asian Development Bank, an urban avalanche is going to hit India. So massive urbanization is being predicted. That is the market-based Predictions saying that Indian economy is doing so well, it would do well. Obviously, economic growth would mean urbanization. People will move from low productive agriculture to high productive sectors. And obviously, the urban growth rate would be high because people will move from agriculture to industry, from low productive sectors to high productive sectors. That's the market-based perspective. But there is a equally strong and vocal section of scholars who have a more radical perspectives. Many of my colleagues, perhaps, I have a little bit of slant of that also. They argue that, look, growth rate of Indian economy may not be that high, but certainly the exploitative nature of the growth process would squeeze the purchasing power in the rural areas. Rural urban inequalities will go up. Rural economies will not be able to sustain. There will be exodus of people from rural areas. They will be forced to move out. Not that urbanization is attracting them. It is a push factor. So you have two alternate perspectives of development. But both of them are coming to the same similar conclusion as far as urbanization is concerned. One is saying there is a healthy development. Economic growth will take place. People will be attracted to the urban sectors and urbanization will be very rapid. Other is that, well, there will be greater inequality with some modest growth rate. And that inequality, and particularly in the rural areas, will squeeze, squeeze the purchasing power and people will be forced to shift to the urban areas with diametrically opposite ideological perspective you would find the conclusions are similar. There will be massive urbanization in India and many of the Asian countries. I thought that we should examine the data a little more carefully to see whether actually there is an evidence of any rapid urbanization in India 
and in Asia. And my thesis is, which I would like to put forward before you for your comment, observation, and further research if you want to do, is that Asia is not going to do Latin America. What Latin America did, because of the political economy being very, very different, Asia is not going to do that. Look at the growth rate of urban population in India. These pillars are giving the percentage of urban population which has been increasing over time, which would happen because, you know, urbanization, urban growth rate is higher than the rural population growth rate because new urban centers come up. There is some amount of migration. So you see percentage of urban population has gone up from in 2001 census to 27-28% to 31.3%. So percentage of urban population has gone up, but what about growth rate of urban population, which is shown by this line? In 1961, there is a sudden dip. This was the definitional problem. I don't want to get take you into that. You are the people of action. No nonsense. This is all statistical matters. I tried to make adjustment, but the peak came during, you know, 71, 81. The highest growth rate of urban population that India has seen was during 71, 81, which was 3.8% per annum. Our population was growing at that time at 2.2%. 3.7, 3.8% is a very high growth rate, but that's the highest that we have seen. But you pick up any document, oh, urbanization is taking place at a massive rate and exodus is taking place, urban centers are bursting out. I have tried to understand what is the political economy of this kind of a projection? Whose vested interest is being served by this alarmistic perspective when we find that during 81-91, during growth rate came down from 3.8% to 3.1%. And during 91-2001, it came down to 2.7%. And during 2001-2011, the growth rate has just been maintained at 2.7%. So there is no evidence of exodus of rural population. Quite on the contrary, urban centers have become exclusionary. Urban centers are not absorbing the rural migrants at the rate they did before two to three decades. Urban, urbanization rate, if you take the large cities of India, 25 of them, excepting two, Bengaluru and Puducherry, where there has been massive aerial expansion, all other metropolitan cities are recording a decline in their growth rate of population because they are exclusionary, they are trying to attract global capital, they are sanitizing, quote unquote, their urban space, there are massive flyovers, you know, shopping malls coming up, earlier land use, which was for informal sector, which was for the slums, they are being cleaned up, sometimes by force, sometimes by some planned program of rehabilitation, and you find rehabilitation programs don't work, they go there and they don't have any access to employment. But nonetheless, if you look at the statistics, you clearly see that growth rate of urban population has declined. This is an interesting graph. These light blue lines are showing the rate of growth of urban population projected for 2025-30. This is also for the same year. This is also the projected growth rate for 2025-30. These are the projections given by the UN agency. You might know World Urbanization Prospect. They bring out every second year. Why so many pillars for the same year, 2025-30? Because they are projections given at different points of time. World Urbanization Prospect in 1995 said that the growth rate of urban population in India by 2025-30 will be something like 3.3%. That is the projection they made. But within five, six years, they realized this is not happening. The revised is downwards. So global agencies are aware, including the World Bank and ADB, that 
Asian urbanization, Indian urbanization is not taking place at the same space. Cities are becoming, to quote unquote, I would say, hostile, unfriendly to the rural migrants. And we do find that the rate of growth of urban population has declined. These are the projections, the dark ones are projections for the growth rate for 2045-50. Even that is showing a decline. This is the Asian population which was projected. This is for Asia. In World Urbanization Prospect 1994 had predicted that this will be 2,720 million people living in urban areas in 2005. This was the projection made in 1994. Am I making sense? I am UN in 1994 एशियाई शहरीकरण का दर और शहर में रहने वाली आबादी जो है उसका अनुमान लगाया था 2720 मिलियन लेकिन 2009 में इस आंकड़े को सुधार कर नीचे करके उन्होंने कहा कि ये 2400 मिलियन भी नहीं होगा देर हैज बीन रिकॉग्निशन ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट द अर्बन प्रोजेक्शंस व्हिच दे हैड मेड अर्लियर इज नॉट गोइंग टू वर्क is not going to be true and these are the growth rates they had projected they have revised it downwards this is for all the asian countries put together the same thing for india they had predicted that by 2020 urban urban population will be 41.3 percent this is what they had projected now they are saying sorry it would not be as high as that 37.5 percent the rate of, this is a percentage of urban population. Similarly, the rate of growth, they have revised downwards. Now, this is a matter of anxiety. This is a matter of worry. That urbanization is not taking place at the same rate. But I'm sure the urban middle class is very happy. They all feel that, oh, Urbanization, if it slows down, there will be better cities, livable cities, and which is in a way true. But nonetheless, this exclusionary urbanization does not allow the poor people in the rural areas. If the rural urban gaps are not increasing, I can understand. But the rural urban gaps in income level, in per capita consumption expenditure has gone up. And if then the rural urban migration slows down, if rate of emergence of new urban centers, big villages converted into urban areas, that is another process of urbanization. If that also slows down, there is something to worry about. You do a sensitivity analysis. If your urban growth rate remains the same, then your share in the global middle class comes down from 29% to 26%. Your rate of urbanization, you must realize, means shifting of workers from agriculture to non-agricultural activities. The possibilities in agriculture at the best can be 3 to 4 percent, whereas other sectors have been predicted to grow at 7, 8 percent. So this is something which should be a matter of anxiety and worry that urbanization is not taking place at the rate that we had anticipated. This is from a paper which was published in EPW. I just looked at the migrants. Percentage of migration of males in the urban areas in India has gone down. Percentage of male migration, percentage of woman migration in the urban areas have gone up slightly, basically because of urban informal sector providing employment opportunities to the woman workforce. A large percentage of them are working as domestic help because the middle class households, there is a larger woman participation rate, they need domestic support. But nonetheless, I don't want to go into the causes right now. What I did, I divided the total migrant population into four parts, first, second, third, fourth quartile. And similarly, I divided the non-migrant population into four parts, bottom 25%, next 25%, third 25%, and the top 25%. And this is showing the per capita expenditure. We find migrants are better off than the non-migrants in the bottom category. They are better off in the second category. They are better off in the third category. They are better off in the fourth category. 
that they, at the top category, which means migrants are better off than the non-migrant population. This is National Sample Survey data for 99, 2000, 2007, 8. Unfortunately, this is the last NSS data which is available, which shows that migrants are much better off than the non-migrant population. Why is it so? I mean, think about it. I don't know how many of you are non-migrants. We are all... NSS and census says anyone who is enumerated at a place other than the place of birth is a migrant, living there for more than six months. Anyone, anyone, but these are the migrants in the urban areas. These are the percentage of migrants to the urban areas and their, share, their per capita expenditure is higher. And not only that, the migrants have become better off. The, if you look at the composition of the migrants, you find there are more literate people coming up. There are more skilled people who are able to come to the urban areas. There are people who are from a slightly higher income bracket. They are getting absorbed in better opportunities. The poor, dispossessed agricultural laborer being thrown out of agrarian system, looking for jobs in the urban areas, that migration has declined. Cities have become unwelcoming, I can say the word hostile, because of the various programs. This is because of elite capture of the urban space. You do find that the rural urban migration of the poorest of the poor has gone down. Whereas you look at the composition of the migrants, you find there is a higher income, higher level of skills. Because of the labor market also requires people with higher level of skills. So this is the nature of urbanization. But by the way, I'm not emphasizing the, on the Asian part. I have a paper in Economic and Political Weekly on exclusionary urbanization in Asian countries. I took 49 Asian countries and showed that in 37 of them, the urban growth rate has gone down and migration from rural to urban areas have gone down in 32 countries. Basically, Asian cities are more exclusionary than Latin American cities. And that's why Asian cities are, I mean, don't go by the uproar in the media. Asian cities are much safer in terms of violence in the cities compared to any Latin American country or African country. Of course, we have, we have much lesser number of violence on the road, even the number of rapes are much less, but that safety we have purchased in Asian countries by keeping, giving lesser freedom to the woman. If the women are not moving out after eight, six o'clock or eight o'clock, that's true. I mean, most of us would not allow our daughters or wives to take a cab and go at nine o'clock. But that's what happens in many of the Latin American countries. So please do not be satisfied and you know, complacent because our underreporting is very high. But nonetheless, with all that, still, because of this exclusionary nature of urbanization, you do find that the migrants are somewhat better off and overall the rate of urbanization has to some extent slowed down. There's another problem I would like to mention about urbanization. Water supply, water availability, and certainly there is a report from UN which was released on 22nd of March 2015, 22nd of March is the World Water Day. They had predicted that by 2050 the water demand is going to be 55% more than what it is today. Water demand for industries would be 400% more. For food it will be 60% more. For energy it will be 70% more. So basically, uh, you know, economic development is going to put tremendous pressure on water and energy consumption and also emissions. You know, these days, India is talked in the global platform not as much for poverty and hunger. India is often, since I was teaching in Germany, I know every alternate seminar, they would talk about India is a major polluter. You know, India is responsible for the global pollution. I will show you a graph. Indian per capita emission would be one-fourth of the world's per capita emission. They said, oh no, don't talk about per capita. Total emission, the increase in the total emission, which is true, our rate of growth in the emission is high, India's and China's growth. But basically the point is making is that if urbanization 
is a major, you know, it results in higher consumption of energy and water. What are the implications of it for the goal number 11, sustainable cities? Now, what I would like to mention is that it's not the overall rate of urbanization. Even if there is an urban avalanche coming, percentage of urban population, which is 31%, which is predicted to be 45% by 2050, now they are revising it downwards. No, 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 it will not be 45%, it will be 40%. Even if it is 40%, it's not a major problem. The major problem is if your urban population is concentrated in few cities. Do you know, in Chennai, of course, they are doing this desalination plant. But do you know, average distance traveled is 300 kilometers for water. In Delhi, in Bangalore, it's about 250 kilometers. In Delhi, if water has to come from Renuka Dam, which is in Himachal Pradesh, it will be again 300 kilometers plus. And that's what puts tremendous pressure. The exploitation of groundwater in India for urbanization is two and a half times more than the rate of recharge. And that's what is important. The structure of urbanization is important, not the overall, you know, growth rate of urban population, because if you increase rural-urban linkages, which has been proposed under SDG 11, increase your rural-urban linkages, take your resources from the immediate hinterland, don't tap water from 300 kilometers. And that we are doing because of the structure of urbanization. Percentage of population living in class 1 cities, which was about 26% in 1901. This has become 72% in 2011. 72% of our total urban population lives in class 1 cities. And that puts the pressure on resources, on energy. You have to go up vertically. And that means more per capita energy consumption. You have to get water from longer and longer distances. The percentage of urban population living in 5 million plus cities. So what is in the numerator? In the numerator, we have the population living in cities which have more than 5 million population. In the denominator, we have total urban population. Okay? And the figure is 7.5% for Europe, for Africa, 9%, less developed countries, 15%, world average, 15.5%, developed countries, 16%, Asia, 18%, South Central Asia, which has India, has 23%. What is the figure for India? Currently, it is 24.3%, which is slightly this is again from UN data, which shows that Indian urbanization is extremely top-heavy. Not only that, a large 72% of the total urban population lives in class 1 cities. Out of the class, you know, urban population, 23.5%, 24% of our urban population lives in 5 million plus cities, which is much higher than the global average, much higher than Europe. And that puts tremendous pressure on utilization of energy resources. Yeah.